In late June of 1988, I had scheduled a visit to Israel to work with Rafi Levine. Over the years, of course, I had visited him many, many times in Jerusalem, and he had, of course, come to the States, and we worked together for a long time. That's a whole story in itself. But I wanted to just recount this one incident. Originally, I had planned to spend a considerable amount of time with Rafi, but the schedule was so tight that I eventually had to plan for a very short visit so that we could just scope out some new research. And I had to get back for a number of reasons, including the forthcoming Gordon Conference and so forth and so forth. So I finally scheduled the trip for a period of one week. And of course, for that short a trip, I didn't need a lot of luggage. In fact, I had planned this so efficiently that all I required was a small uh, so-called Avis bag, a very small canvas satchel with a few clothes in it. And then, of course, I had my briefcase full of technical papers and scientific articles and so forth. Uh, Rafi had already uh, arranged for my ticketing through El Al Airlines, the uh, Israel Airlines. So I went to the El Al counter at the uh, Los Angeles International Airport. When I uh, attempted to uh, present my ticket and uh, get cleared through security, the young uh, Israeli security agent started to interrogate me about what my intentions were, and uh, he was quite concerned about the uh, luggage problem, since I had only this small handbag of luggage. I explained to him that I was going to uh, visit a friend of mine, a colleague, Professor Levine of the Hebrew University, and that we were going to do some research together during this period in Israel. He said, uh, what is the duration of your stay in Israel? What is your planned duration? He said, looking at this airline ticket, it, it appears as though you're going to be there for, uh, for one week. I said, yes, uh, it's a one-week trip this time. Normally we spend more time, but this is one week. And he said, uh, now you mean to tell me he says, that you are going to take a trip to Israel with this small handbag of luggage, and you are going to be there for less than seven days, and you're going to be doing research. That's not entirely believable, sir. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat this story to my supervisor. Uh, the supervisor also was a little bit incredulous. He said, what? Research? In seven days? Hardly believable. In any case, I was able to convince these gentlemen that I should be allowed to get on the LL plane after they searched both my luggage and my uh, briefcase for some kind of hidden weapons. But on the way over, I began to think a little bit about the, the truth in their skepticism. Research, what? In seven days? And yet, as implausible as it sounds, some of the best research ideas can come in a flash, they can come in the middle of the night, they can come on an airplane. Now the execution can't be accomplished in seven days, but in terms of creativity in the field of pure science, seven days is infinity. Let me continue in the same vein. Sometimes on an airplane, when you're sitting cramped and hampered, you can't really do some serious reading or writing. You've finished eating and drinking, and you've got a long silent stretch ahead and there's an absurd movie going on in which you have no interest whatsoever. Under these conditions it's often possible to think and to think creatively. It is remarkable to me to recall how many of these airplane flights have given me the opportunity to do really creative thinking. I usually pull out a few index cards and start doodling, and my mind runs free as I look out the window, look at the clouds, and hear the constant drone of the engines. And under those conditions, as I'm scribbling little notes to myself on the cards, ideas for new experiments often come to me. And by the time the flight is over, it's been possible to come up with a fairly well-defined research problem, which warrants serious consideration back home when I have available, of course, uh, my library of books and journals. But the really creative part is almost inevitably done away from the laboratory and away from the office, usually under conditions of isolation. Of course, we're all familiar with the stories of uh, the uh, discoveries made in dreams. Oftentimes, uh, during a period of insomnia, uh, rather than a period of dreams, I've had very interesting thoughts come to my mind about research projects, either ongoing or 
potential future uh, subjects of investigation. And in the quiet of the night, once again in total isolation, hearing only the ticking of a clock nearby, it's possible to let the mind run free, and oftentimes something new and exciting comes comes in, and, and uh, one is tempted to rush, get out of bed and get dressed, and run to the lab. Uh, one has to restrain a bit and, and usually just make some notes for the morning, but it is interesting how these creative ideas come, uh, blossom out without any apparent external stimulus, and usually under conditions of isolation from others.